Hello. I hope you can hear me. Let me see if my mic is on. Yeah. Okay. So I'm back with a live a rebroadcast of last uh, two Sundays ago, a week ago Sunday. Was it Sunday? Yes. When I talked about teaching children about the Holocaust and I had trouble. Let me tell you what I did. All right. So I was complaining because I couldn't share my screen. And I really wasn't happy about just having you listen to what I was talking about, because I think the best way to learn is to see what's going on. So at the end of the broadcast, I, 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 uh, feedback comes up and it says, how is your um, broadcast? And it says, thumbs up, thumbs down. I put thumbs down and they wanted what, to know why. And I said, I couldn't share my screen. Almost. It was 90 minutes later, but to me, it seemed like immediately because sometimes when you complain, it goes on just unacknowledged. Anyway, so Grant reaches out to me from StreamYard and he, I'm not being paid to say this. This is what happened. And I really appreciate them for this. And he goes, I'm sorry you had trouble. Can I help you troubleshoot? I said, oh, wow. Yes, please. I was really surprised to hear from them. He goes, okay. Um, I'll be glad to help you. And then I said, you know something, Grant? I think the problem was with me. I forgot to hear sh hit the share button before I tried to share the screen. Duh. So that's what was happening the last time I was live. So this time I do have the um, everything set up. And so we're going to talk again about how to teach ch uh, children about the Holocaust, the Holocaust and um and human rights, they're related. Just about everything we do is related, just like the law. But the reason why I'm focusing on middle schools is because they're at an age where they're starting to appreciate thinking a little bit abstractly and critically. Actually, babies can think critically, although it to a certain, de a certain degree, but I'm not going to get into that. Children who are um, between the ages of seven and 12 are starting to really begin honing in on abstract thinking and honing, they're beginning to use their critical thinking skills. And because of the brouhaha, which um, was the impetus for this live initially, it's pretty much died down, but the concepts and the issues, are, they're still universal. This happens to be about what Whoopi said about the Holocaust. It could be anything, but this is what we're going to talk about today. And so the, the, the reason why we're going to look at, well, the way we're going to do this is to look at two people who lived during the Holocaust. One is an adult and one was a child. One was an adult, one was a child. And the reason why we're doing this is because as I said, children need to learn how to start thinking critically based on fact. And there's a big, you know, discussion about fake news and fake facts, facts are facts. And that's the foundation upon which to learn to think critically, form opinions and what have you. So with that, let's move on to, um, I'm just going to put up the, all right, so this is what I wanted to feature last time. And it's a pretty much a slideshow, but it's also going to be something that I will walk you through when the time is appropriate. All right, so let me stop here. This is the, the Nuremberg Law, Nuremberg Gif Giz Gizetsta, Gizetsia. I always stumble on that word. And this is what I was referring to before. The two columns to the right are referred to Jews. Judah means Jew. The column, the two columns in the middle, the Mischling are the um, hybrid or mixed race. And then Deutsch Ludica are the other Dutch blood, uh, excuse me, the German blooded people. So as you can tell on the chart, the the Yuda are considered Jews for generations down the line, regardless if you look to the one to the right of the far right, to the left of the far right, you have one um, 
George Boudica as a grandparent, but still the children, the offspring, generations down are considered Yuda. With the mixed race um, people, regardless of how many Deutsch Blutica you have in your family, in your family tree, if you have one person who is uh, um, Mishli or a Yuda or whatever, Black, then that person um, is not considered Aryan or Deutsch Blutica. So that's the... Um, that's what I was referring to when I was talking about the Nuremberg Law number three. So this is a, I don't want to start this yet. All right. So this is uh, a picture of Hans Jürgen Masakwa when he was a child. He was born into an upper class family in Germany because his grandfather was a a diplomat. He was born in Hamburg. His father was a law student uh, studying, I believe it was in England, but his mother was was a, a Deutsche Boudicca. And so um, I want to give you an idea. Unlike Jews, Blacks were so few in numbers that they were relegated to low priority status in the Nazis' lineup for extermination. Also, the unexpectedly rapid advance of the Allied military juggernaut kept the Nazis preoccupied with their own survival and in many cases crushed the Gestapo executioners before they could put their finishing touches on their racial cleansing. Thus, I fell through the cracks of modern history's most extensive, most systematic mass murder scheme with the fortunate result that I am still around and are able to write this account of my life. All right. Um, so that's the reason why I wanted you to see that is because let me just get back to where I want to be. Is because he's talking about the the list of priorities that the Nazis have for exterminating people they didn't want in the country. And so there were more Jews than anybody. So that's why they started with the Jews. But because of the Allies' um, forces attacking them from various directions, it split up their concentration and they needed to survive if they wanted to finish out this, this program they had. And um, But they weren't successful, thank God. They also wanted to uh, eliminate gays. So I know it's Black Jews and gays. It might have been um, gypsies. I'm not sure. I don't remember. But I know those were the three uh, classes of people that they were seeking to exterminate. And it didn't matter. So let me take a step back. So when it comes to teaching a child, letting them know what, letting them know this fact is not going to hurt them. And the reason why I say that is this, it gives them a foundation from which to examine the world with eyes that are clear and not, um, not, not sugarcoated. Children will let you know how much they can, they want to learn because by the questions that they ask. And granted, you have to answer them in a way that's age appropriate for them but don't lie to them because if you want to maintain your credibility, credibility, you have to be willing to tell the truth and risk feeling uncomfortable yourself in order to maintain that, that bond of trust. Another thing is this, when children understand the truth, they can start making comparisons because children who are at the, between the ages of seven and 12 middle schoolers are starting to make comparisons between themselves and, and the other children. So on some level, parents who are up in arms about teaching their children the truth for the fear of them feeling inferior, <clears throat> there's, some, there's some legitimacy to that. 
But the problem is this, because children are open-minded, those fears are projected onto the child and the child isn't allowed to learn. So I'm going to continue with um, the, what did I do here? Okay, I'm gonna continue with the, with the show. And here you're gonna meet, you're gonna meet Julius Alsace, who was the, he was a former mayor of Berlin. He joined, um, you're gonna see the name of it. He joined the resistance to the Nazi party. party. And I'm gonna explain the significance of sharing that information once you, once you see what I'm talking about. So, um, and this is based on a series that I did regarding the UN when I was doing research in, in throughout um, Germany, it wasn't just in Berlin, but I was doing research and to commemorate the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, rights which took place in 2018. And the impetus for drafting and ratifying the what's called UDHR was the was was the um second world war so let's continue and it's gonna start one notable congregant from the ekadaknis kirche was fritz julius elsass born on july 11th 1890 he studied law and received his doctorate in political science in 1912. During his student days, he converted to Christianity and was baptized in the Kaiser Wilhelm Memorial Church on August 19, 1913. In 1919, he joined the Liberal German Democratic Party and was mayor of Berlin from 1931. Immediately after the Nationalist Socialists came to power, he was removed from office. After a failed coup attempt of July 1944, Elsass twice gave shelter in his house to Karl Grodeler, although as a Jew, he himself was particularly endangered. On August 10, 1944, Fritz Elsass was arrested, taken to the Sachsenhausen concentration camp. He was murdered without trial. Okay, so these, um, these stone, these are these um stone oh i forgot what they're called um they're set in the ground throughout germany and they acknowledge the lives of um the jewish people who were exterminated so the first one you saw was charles um godica and this one is for fritz alsas this one happens to be in um in Berlin, even though he was from Stuttgart or someplace in Bavaria. Anyway, um, let's continue. I think this is all we have for, yeah. Okay, so. Almost took myself out of the stream. All right, so. What happens next is the point that I wanted to make is um, it didn't matter what your social status was. This is a person who, you know, he 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 converted from Judaism to to Christianity. He was an upstanding person. He was a pillar in the community. He um, he wasn't a threat to anybody except maybe Hitler when he tried to assassinate him. But anyway, the point is this, this Elsass was a person that would be considered um, privileged, elite, but that didn't matter. The only thing that Hitler cared about was the bloodline. And when you think, when you look at what the Aryans looked like, tall, blonde, blue-eyed, and you think about what Hitler looks like, 
that's something to have a conversation about with your children you know where's the where, where's the consistency there also you could ask them you know there's an ethical question that comes up too was it right for him to join the resistance to take out somebody who was killing who killed six million jews and it doesn't matter what the child has as an answer you may not agree with their answer what matters is that they're thinking and what matters is that the reason why they say what they say so well let's say the child says well the Ten Commandments say, thou shalt not kill. So he was wrong for killing. And then rather than say, but he, but, because you don't want to negate what the child is saying, you would, you, a good way to respond is that's true. However, if you think about what Hitler was doing by killing 6 million Jews, do you think it was a good idea to stop him? And how would you do that? Well, I don't want to make give a compound question to a child. Do you think it would be a good idea to stop him? Just to see what their reasoning is. What matters is that their reasoning. What matters is that you acknowledge what they say, you don't in a non-judgmental way, and continue to ask questions about what, what their responses are. This is how you teach your child to think critically. So that, that's an ethical issue. And so by asking these questions, you're teaching your child ethics and they don't have to know that you're teaching them ethics. What matters is that you're teaching them how to think and ask questions. That's what's most important. So let's move on to the next piece. And this is where um, we're going to go back to Hans Masakwai, he says something that I find profound. This is based on his book, um, his biography, um, Witness, Destined to Witness. That's the name of the book. And he talks about, well, I'm going to let him tell you. Hanni Wieder was a World War I veteran, fanatical Hitler supporter, and German writer. He became headmaster at Kaidnerkampfschule, where Hans attended school. Masakwa recalls, as he paraded in front of us, he suddenly spotted me among the ranks of boys and, like a snake trying to mesmerize its prey, fixed his hateful gaze on me. What I intend to install in this school is pride in being German boys in a national socialist German state he intoned without taking his eyes off of me. I had grown quite uncomfortable under the principal's stare, but just as I was about to avert my eyes, he moved on, continuing to elaborate on his theme. I couldn't rid myself of the unfamiliar yet unsettling feeling of having just met a personal enemy, someone who wished me ill. It didn't take very long before I found my suspicions confirmed. The first time Vitor gave me tangible evidence of how he felt about me was when he filled in for our sick gym teacher. The principal announced that he would conduct a moot probe, test of courage. He had us build an obstacle course. One gap was so wide that the only way it could be traversed was by jumping into the air and grabbing onto a thick rope that dangled from the ceiling and then, Tarzan-like, swinging to the other side. To add to the difficulty of the maneuver, Rita positioned one boy beside the gap with the instruction to keep the rope in constant motion with the aid of a long stick. I got through the major part of the course quite easily and was headed for the big gap when I saw that Vrida himself had taken the place of the boy with the stick. Rather than letting the rope swing to and fro, he held it back in such a way that it remained totally out of my reach. As I waited for him to release the rope, ready to leap as soon as it swung toward me, Vrida shouted, Feigling! Coward! Kind moot! No courage! Get out of the way! Not quite believing that he could be so unfair, 
I waited another moment to see if perhaps he would relent and send the rope my way. But he became only more enraged, shouting at me, out of the way, give somebody with courage a chance. Get over there with the other cowards. This example doesn't begin to scratch the surface of the indignities Hans suffered at the hands of Nazi instructors at school. A final example of the racially hostile environment in which he lived occurred at his mother's place of work. Usually my mother came home from work looking cheerful, ready to spend another pleasant evening with me. But one night, instead of greeting me with her customary smile, she seemed on the verge of tears. When I asked her what was wrong, she blurted out the devastating news that she had been fired from her job. She lost her job as a result of a new Nazi policy that barred Jews and other politically unreliable persons from government employment. It wasn't until many years later that Muti told me the real reason for her dismissal, the fact that she had conceived a child by an African. Since my grandfather, a very dark man, had been the dominant figure of my universe, with most whites playing deferential, if not subordinate roles, I came to regard a dark complexion and kinky hair as superior attributes and accepted the celebrity treatment accorded me by the public as my well-deserved due. Only after years of maturing and of being rejected, humiliated, and psychologically brutalized was I able to see Hitler himself for what he really was. Instead of putting the blame for my problems with racists where it belonged, I blamed myself. More than anything, I blamed my appearance, especially my African hair, which I had come to loathe. Okay, so significant points that he makes in this, um, in this, in this um, section of the book, and that is this. He was born into the upper class. He was used to whites being subordinate to his father and his family. There's a part in the book where he describes how he was so fond, um, fond over by people of all races. And so he had a certain expectation as to how he should be treated. And when you take that concept and apply it in the US, it's the reverse. Whites are, co are comfortable being treated with a certain level of um, deference, what we call white privilege. And it plays out in the court system, it plays out in law enforcement, it plays out in classrooms. I have witnessed it as um, an attorney working for the New York City Board of Education. And so the, 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 the exposure that he had, when children are growing up, the world that they grow up in, they think is this is how the world works. So what he's saying isn't unusual to that degree. What is unusual that this is a black person in a white society living, having lived to a, a certain degree of his life with this expectation. And that's why I say that parents who are concerned about their children feeling bad, have a legitimate concern. But the biggest concern is how they are accustomed to being treated with de or deference. And another thing is this that I want to point out. When children experience things, they blame themselves. So that's not unusual either. He came to blame himself for the way he was treated. All children do that. That's a universal experience. The last thing I want to mention is that he came to loathe himself because of how he was treated as a result of living and growing up in that Nazi under that Nazi regime, which is not unusual and not, not an unusual experience for children of color growing up in the US. So how do you address this with your children? Because this is the crux of the concern in the United States. And it's this, especially when children are comparing themselves at an age when they're comparing themselves to other children and they're internalizing the events that they experience, particularly outside of the home. If your children are fortunate, they have children of, of many races as friends. And so, and if they do, 
Ask them, how would they feel if somebody mistreated their friend so-and-so or their cousin so-and-so or your mommy or your daddy because they, they come from a mixed race household? It's not unlike what the Tutsis and the, and the, Hutu, and the Hutus, I believe it was, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, experienced during um, the Rwandan genocide. It, it's, it's, it's a tribal issue. And in the US, you have a, there's an amalgam of different tribes, as it were, if you want to talk about the different races of people, classes, and cultures that live here. And that, but that tribalism mentality is something that we have an opportunity to overcome if we allow ourselves to do it. And this is the lesson that children can be taught, taught at home. So that starts to get the children thinking about, wow, this is unfair um, to treat people differently just because of whatever, their race, their religion, their sexual orientation. And especially when it's someone that they truly love or care about, it hurts the child. Sidebar, when parents fight and they try to put the children against the other, the person that, hurts, that gets hurt the most is the child. And, and that, that's just something I wanted to put out there. That's a, that's a sidebar. It's, it's, I'm talking about emotional abuse at this point, and that's what's going on. That's, that's the crux of what he was referring to when he was saying how he come to feel from superior to inferior. And nobody wants their child to feel inferior, but children between the ages of seven and 12 are at an age in life where they are, they are taught, they are learning to either feel competent or inferior. And competency is, a, is associated a lot of times with superiority. However, all children are competent in whatever gifts they have. And that's something that children, the sooner they can appreciate that, the better off they'll be. So I'm going to go back to the um, to this slideshow of sorts. So this is the book. Um, and I put a link in the description. This is another book, Ellie Wazell. If you want to experience, if you want to learn about um, personal accounts of what it was like to grow up in Nazi Germany by people who lived through it. Um, Hans Masakwa recently passed away. I think he passed away maybe, I don't know, maybe either five or 10 years ago. And um, Ellie Wissell, um, he his book Night is a good book to read. And you have access to, you can get access to them for free if you qualify for a free trial with um, Audible. It's, it's easier to, it's easier to get through a book through, by listening to it, especially if you have a busy schedule. So that's available to you if you like to have it. Now, um, the next thing we're gonna move on to is a, um, a video that I did about man's inhumanity to man. And this, this segues into the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. As I mentioned earlier, the um, Universal Declaration of Human Rights was established as a result of the horrific events that took place during World War II. So let's move on with that. And um, it'll just be, I think- I don't Man's know. inhumanity to man is as old as mankind, which is why the Universal Declaration of Human Rights were drafted and adopted. Today, I'll provide you with three illustrations from three locations from the scrapbook of mankind. Let's start with the United States and Jim Crow, which took place from 1887 to the 1950s. It illustrated blacks as buffoons and began because white Southern landowners blamed the former black slaves for their defeat in the Civil War that ended the abolition of slavery, which negatively impacted their economic well-being. 
So Southern legislators enacted segregation laws to protect their status by threatening the rights of former slaves. Does this mean that every white American favored Jim Crow? Of course not. It means those responsible for its implementation and were complicit with it were in violations of Articles 1, 2, 3, and 25 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Now let's move on to Germany und Kristallnacht, which took place on the night of November 9, 1938. That's when the Nazis blamed Jews for Germany's defeat in World War I that left the country in economic disaster. So the German co government decided to enact laws restricting Jews the right to earn a living, full citizenship, and an education. Jews' homes, hospitals, schools, synagogues, and businesses were destroyed, leaving them in ruins. Does that mean every German supported Kristallnacht und der Holocaust? Of course not. However, the aftermath of World War II was the impetus for the creation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And while the Declaration didn't exist at the time, the atrocities against Jews violated Articles 1, 2, 3, 5, and 17. For our third example, we'll look at Israel, Warnachba, when Zionist Jews systematically created Israel by forcibly pushing Palestinians off their land. Jews destroyed homes and agricultural land for Palestinians. They revoked their residency rights, deported them, and perpetuated military attacks. Jews to this day deny Palestinians their internationally recognized legal right of return to their homeland. That's from 1948 to the present. Does that mean every Jewish person supports the inhumane treatment against Palestinians? Of course not. It means those who are instrumental in implementing or complicit with the events giving rise to the next bar were in violation of Articles 1, 2, 3, 12, 17, 28, and 30 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. In addition to providing contemporary illustrations of man's inhumanity to man, today's video also featured individuals who chose to live their lives with dignity regardless of the public political policy that denied others their human rights. Okay, so that's the tie between um, the Holocaust being about race and, and being about um, man's inhumanity to man. And so it was about both. Man's inhumanity to man has been going on much longer than the Holocaust. But, it, but that was the last straw. That plus the bombing of Japan by the US the atomic bomb, it, it had to stop. And as I'm recording this live, there's an impending war that could wind up being a, 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 a return to the Cold War if we're not careful. And that's with the Ukraine and Russia. However, it seems as though um, the, cut, the world it seems to be a little more united this time around. Now, when it comes to teaching your child about this and the confusion that some people have experienced and the pushback that um, will be experienced, uh, justly or unjustly, depending on what side of the fence you're on, it still was an opportunity for um, discussion to take place, and it still is. In that, children need the, the, unless if you know if you don't know your history, you're doomed to repeat it. So, children, the sooner they can know the truth about history and make it relatable, because. And the way to do that is to bring it, 
bring it back to their friends, bring it back to their family. How would you feel if this happened to so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so because so-and-so is different or because so-and-so believes X, Y, and Z? The concept, when you can make the concept relatable to them, they can better analyze it and they can better internalize what it is you're trying to teach them. So um, the to commemorate the, the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was on um, December 10th, every year is Human Rights Day, because that's the day in 1948 that the UN General Assembly ratified the UDHR. I created this, um, this video um, about Human Rights Day, about human rights generally and what it means. Drafted at Palais du Chaillot under the leadership of Eleanor Roosevelt, the draft committee represented various nations with a variety of cultures, customs, and languages. Among the 30 articles of the UDHR, nine are considered fundamental freedoms. They are self-determination, liberty, due process of law, freedom of movement, of thought, of religion, of expression, peaceful assembly, and freedom of association. Although the atrocities committed during World War II was the main impetus for its creation, the UDHR acknowledges man's history of barbarous acts. It further acknowledges that all people want to live with dignity, and its foundation rests in freedom, justice, and peace. Article 29 articulates our individual responsibility to stand up for human rights, which is within everyone's reach, be it Article 2, 16, 21, or 25, or any number thereof. What matters is that we do our part to promote peace in this world, because how we live our lives determine what contributions you make to it. Okay. Um, all right. So there, the way to make that relatable to a child is to Oh, my goodness. I just lost my train of thought. All right. So now this was about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, why it was established um, and the history of man's and humanity to man, which harkens back to the previous video that I showed you. And then it went on to say that. What did it say? And if you had trouble hearing it, I'm, I'm, I apologize because it sounds a little wonky at first when um, I, I started to replay the video. I'll have to see how it turns out actually on YouTube since I'm in, I'm in StreamYard right now. But um, showing children, oh, I know what it was. When they were talking about the fundamental um, rights, they are consistent with the uh, Bill of Rights of the United States. And one thing that's important about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Declaration of Human Rights, acknowledges the dignity that everybody is born with and that we, we are responsible for respecting one another. So that's another, um, another source of a conversation, especially when it comes to sibling rivalry and respect, which is what I'm going to be touching on in the next uh, week or so, um, I should say a few weeks. And um, the reason why I have the seeker method is because the seed stands for civics, because once a child realizes their place in the world and the Universal Declaration does the same thing, then they know how they can maneuver in it and what the parameters are for respect and um, abiding by the law, which hasn't been a, a, a big um, feather in the, in, the, in the cap of our federal leaders in, 
in um, Congress. But that's a story for another time. Anyway, um, so that's how you talk about that, is bringing the, just bringing their awareness to a sense of hope. Because with the kind of discourse that children or argument or fighting or whatever you want to call it, the children are witness, it could be frightening and confusing. And I say that from experience, having grown up during the civil rights movement. And uh, Hans Masakwai also expressed, shared that insight when he was talking about how he went from having, being treated with respect is due to being, to devolving to self loathing simply because how he was treated. So um, I don't have the, I don't have the recording for the next thing that I want to show you, but this is, this goes to a, um, a CNN report. Oh, okay. Um, I can't, I can see his face, but I can't think of his name. He was interviewing the um, author of this book, Lowry, and it's number of the stars. This is a book that was mentioned in, I forget if it was Texas or Tennessee. And um, they wanted to give, they wanted teachers to, if they were gonna talk about the, about, I don't know if it was the Holocaust or just facts. I think it was the Holocaust. When I, The point is this, when it comes, they wanted to tell children to give alternative facts to factual, to, to his, historical, facts. And how do you do that? The reason why this is important is because children have to understand that the basis for the debate is not to debate whether something happened or not. History tells us it happened. What matters is that you take a stand, and this is what the point I was trying to make throughout this stream is that asking them questions, what do they think about this? What did it did? It, there's no dispute that the Holocaust took place, regardless of what the deniers have to say about it. It happened. Okay, so now what do you think about Alsace's position about trying to assassinate Hitler? Do you think that was right? What do you think could have they could have done differently? Not that not that they might have been able to do anything differently. Um, this is I'm talking about the Jews now who are being swept up in in Germany, but just to get the child to start thinking. What's important about this book, Number of the Stars, is that um, this Danish, the Danes took their took care of their their um, Jewish neighbors and smuggled them. It's about one girl who gets smuggled into. I think she winds up in Sweden some neutral place, some neutral country. And that's the, and that's the, that's what the book is about. It's about helping one another. And this is a good way for children to learn, to have a discussion without sugarcoating what really happened. So um, that's one of the books that you can have available to you by taking advantage of the link. The, this book, 20 and 10, this is a book that one of my teachers, I want to stop this before it moves on. All right, I'm gonna to have to go back. Um, I didn't move quick enough. I got through the major part of the course but at the oh, hands of not the instructors too, too and too utilize was that. All right, so we talked about Elie Wiesel, we talked about man's and humanity to man, we talked about the universal declaration. Oh, and another thing about the universal, what's remarkable about, um, the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, I'm gonna stop right here, is that you had nine people from nine different countries with, who, that spoke nine different- Customs languages. and languages. I'm on the 30. All right, nine people from nine different countries with nine different um, customs and languages and laws. And it took a couple of years, I believe it was, for them to finally, bring a draft to the UN General Assembly, but they did it. And um, Eleanor Roosevelt, who was the chair 
of the drafting committee was instrumental in being a moderator and being a facilitator and being a peacemaker and getting people from different um, walks of life, from different value systems to come together and put together a document of 30 different articles that the um, the signatories agreed to abide by, more or less. But that's a story for another time. Um, so that's remarkable that they were able to do that. And it wasn't these, this is the, um, well, let me just keep going. All right, so um, now I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, I was talking about the books. Uh, the book, this book here, 20 and 10. 20 and 10 was a book that my sixth grade teacher read to us. And what I liked about it is that the one thing that I remembered about this thing was I didn't remember how it ended. I remember that there were 20 children who had to protect 10 children from the Nazis. But what I remembered about them sharing that chocolate. Anyway, the stories of these 20 children, they, they were in, a, I don't know if they were in orphanages or just in the school, but they were in the mountains and they were playing the flight to Egypt. When a man comes along and brings 10 Jewish children to hide from the Nazis. And the nun who was responsible for the children went down to town to pick up the mail and get some rations, which they had to share with the children. And the children didn't complain about that. And they come across, fortunately, they came upon a cave because while the um, nun was away in in the, in the village, in the town, she gets arrested and the Nazis come up to the children and they can see that the Nazis come in. So they hide the children, the Jewish children in the mountain and they never give up those kids. I found that so heroic. But there's um, there are some paid parts of it that can get a bit dicey. And um, so that's 20 and 10. And then there's um, another book. What was, oh, Mouse. Mas was the book that started the whole um, debacle with um, The View. When, when, when Whoopi said that it wasn't about race, it was about man saying humanity to man, which is true. It was about man saying humanity to man. And, um, and it was about race. All right, so those books are available through the link that I have. And this is when, um, this is Jonathan Greenblatt. He wrote a book called It Could Happen Here. And he's talking about, he was talking with, I think it was Don Lemon, Don Lemon about what was going on. I don't, I, I don't have, I didn't upload the um, audio to it, but this is the book that he wrote about how what happened in Germany could happen in the US too, which is so true, especially today. So now this is what, this is, let me just take myself out of this. Now, I find this quote by Kim Goodwin, the president of ABC, ABC New Disingenuous, she's, when she says that the culture of ABC is one that is driven, kind, inclusive, respectful, and transparent. And that Whoopi's comments don't align with those values. I don't see how that's true. I don't see how that's true because if it was inclusive and respectful, they would have respected, they would have respected where she was coming from because what she said wasn't a lie. She was she misspoke about the, the race part, but it was about man's inhumanity to man. If they would be if they were kind, they would have at least acknowledged that that part was true and schooled her on the rest. Her comments, if her comments don't align with those values then I'm not sure about ABC's values, especially in the way that she uh, Whoopi was treated in the end. So um, I think that's it for the, that's it for the slideshow. What I do know is that this is a good conversation to have at the dinner table with children so that they can understand. They don't, you don't have to agree with them. 
and they don't have to, don't, please don't berate your children if they have a different um, opinion than you. Understand why they're saying that. Understand their thought process. But to berate them is only going to cause them to clam up and you're telling them, you're teaching them that you're not trustworthy, that you're not the person to go to when they have a question about something. So with that, I hope that this was more helpful than the original broadcast. And I'm going to end the broadcast now. Thank you for watching.